Well, the mind always wants that one way, right? Sure. Whether it's in your book or in someone's technique or some seminar, we're always looking for this thing where, well, this goes back to the idea of the big bang of cosmic enlightenment, you know, Maurice right. Book's cosmic consciousness, and you write about this, and I'm the same way. I really used to fervently believe that I could become fully, permanently, forever enlightened, just like I'd read about in all of the books, if I just did something. Yes. And over time, that belief um, sort of gives way to what you have so wonderfully called ordinary enlightenment. Well, or everyday enlightenment. Or everyday enlightenment. Uh, Chogyam Trungpa, uh, he was a Tibetan master, worked uh, out of Naropa Institute. He founded that place in Colorado when he was alive. He once said of the spiritual search, better never begin. Once begun, better finish. And he said better never begin because the sense of search reinforces a sense of dilemma that only sent us seeking in the first place. This not enoughness, this constant sense of not enoughness. Now many people feel like, well, if I'm satisfied, I'll, I'll just be lackadaisical and, and indolent and I'll give up and I won't improve. I haven't found that to be true. Just the opposite tends to be true. The judgments we hold on ourselves only hold them in place, hold, stick us in place. And rather than going through life from a sense of lack, a sense of uh, I'm not enough, this isn't enough, life has to be better, and I need to seek this quote-unquote enlightened state. It's the ultimate pie in the sky. Now, I'm not saying that in the classical traditions, certain people don't meditate for years and years and solve koans and do certain disciplines and finally purify the body and mind and then have a free attention to, to have this realization of the, our, our unity or one's oneness with God, whatever terms we like to use. A sense of freedom and liberation, that realization, that that getting the punchline to the cosmic joke of life, that may happen in certain cases where people have strong senses of freedom and liberation from the seeing life as it is and transcending that. And yet, we don't want to go around miserable because we're not going to get to the top of the mountain because most of our lives are spent on the mountain, traveling up the path, not getting to the top. We may not do it this lifetime or another lifetime. So there's a point at which we need to completely surrender to the moment, to trust God, to trust life, to trust this moment. And then we can be happy now as a discipline, as a way that happiness is not the end of the way, but it is the way. And I don't mean a feeling of happiness. Very important to differentiate this. We can talk about this later, about emotions, because it's a very important area. But it's radiating happiness to others. Despite what we may be feeling, physically, emotionally, or mentally, we can smile, we can radiate, we can bring energy into the world. And we, we know heroic instances. You were telling me about a woman who was, uh, who was paralyzed in an auto accident and what she brought. People like Ram Das, who's been an exemplary person after a stroke, the attitude he's brought to life, despite the difficulties. So, to me, it's all about now. Oh, gosh, that's not a revelation. Nobody's slapping their forehead going, oh, now, yeah, that's important. But many people talk about, for example, the here and now, the importance of it, without really understanding how to live that way. And in some of my seminars, I take people through a process where they actually get how to do that, rather than just know it's a nice idea.